Hello and welcome to the President's Podcast right here on the record with the Ohio Senate. The views, the news excludes. I'm John Fortney, the host, the director of communications for the Ohio Senate Republican Caucus, the majority caucus in the Senate. Sitting in this week for Senate President Matt Huffman is Ohio Senator Jerry Serino from Cuyahoga County in Northeast Ohio. Thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Glad to be here with you, John. You know, interesting election week, of course, a general election on sort of an off year. Next year's election will be a very big year with the president presidential race. But uh, a very interesting race in your district. Well, not in your district specifically, but in the city of Cleveland regarding a bill also that you uh, passed in the Senate, Senate Bill 158, and it was a charter amendment that would drain funds away from the city budget. Give me some perspective on what happened with that election and why your bill is important. Sure. Uh, first, John, let me explain uh, to the viewers uh, and listeners what, what uh, the, the whole issue was about. It was uh, the proposal for the charter amendment was for establishing the what they called the people's budget, okay, uh, and what they were looking to do was to change Cleveland's charter to allow uh, the people's budget to siphon off two percent of the city's operating budget, which amounts to roughly fourteen million dollars a year, uh, which would have to be taken from other things that the city now supports with the, with those funds and put it in the hands of um, appointed uh, but unelected uh, uh, community members uh, who, by the way, could be as young as 16 uh, and uh, with input uh, being suggested from people even as young as 13 uh, and to be used for undetermined projects uh, without proper vetting, uh, without following through with the normal ethical requirements that we all see in the legislature or city councils. Uh, it was just absolutely a ridiculous uh, proposal, but it was uh, it was issue 38 on the Cleveland ballot, which is not in my district, but it's Northeast Ohio, and I certainly care about Northeast Ohio and about the state. And uh, this uh, this would have taken away authority to spend money from the elected city council, who actually, in my opinion, operate the real people's budget, which is the operating budget that city council and the mayor propose and adopt every uh, fiscal period. This, this sounds like a uh, dangerous type of a proposition that might uh, be floated in other communities around Ohio. Is that the reason behind the bill that you were uh, pushing and sponsoring uh, that passed the Ohio Senate? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this was not just a Cleveland issue. We, we Obviously, Cleveland was the only one that had it on the ballot at this point in time. But my concern and the reason I, I, uh, I uh, sponsored and uh, that the Senate adopted in a very quick order, uh, Senate Bill 158, was because if, if we felt at the time that if it were successful in Cleveland, that uh, we would see it coming to a city near, near you, wherever you are. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the election this past Tuesday was pretty close. Uh, it was... Uh, uh, 49 to 51 percent, and with over 32,000 people voting for the people's budget to be established in the charter. And again, I want to remind everybody listening that that the $14 million that would be siphoned away from the budget would not be taken from incremental dollars. It would be taken from the already approved operating budget, which would mean that public safety, infrastructure, uh, senior citizens support programs, that money would have to come from all of those things, and that's what alarmed a lot of us. And we don't want this to be happening uh, around the state, certainly. The elected members of city council are really the people that are sent there to be the stewards of your city tax dollars and your city budget. That, that is correct. And, and, that, and critics, including the Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com, who took a really interesting stand, they, they took a very negative stand on my bill, on Senate Bill 158, which was designed to stop this from happening. Uh, they, they came out against uh, the initiative for the Charter Amendment, but against my bill, which was, in, it, so it's a, it's a, it's a crazy uh, bit of logic that I haven't quite uh, figured out yet, except that they tend to be inconsistent. And, and again, my name associated with it as a Republican uh, sort of gets that kind of reaction that even doesn't make sense. You would think that even in a, um in more of a democratic uh, stronghold like Cleveland and Cleveland city politics, 
that even some of the organizations behind the scenes would have been against that idea because whether it's construction or whatever it may be, whatever organization, that would be concerning to them as well because they want to have a say in how money is spent for city projects. And if it goes to an unelected board or organization that portrays itself as the city budget or the the budget of the people, but really there's no oversight of what they do. Right, and, and again, we have uh, some pretty re, uh, tough restrictions on how money gets spent by public officials in the state of Ohio at all levels. There are ethics requirements for those who are making decisions. We all have to file uh, ethics reports and, and, and we're monitored uh, in our activities by those who are watching us. Uh, and those are all good things to make sure that the people's money, uh, the real people's budget is being spent, whether at the state level or at the local level. Uh, correctly. Uh, and in th this proposal, which even a Democrat in the Senate called the worst written um, uh, 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 issue that was described uh, for the ballot uh, initiative in the charter, it was one of the worst ones he's ever seen. Hmm. And, and, and it was. It's, it was laughable. When I read it, I had to keep from laughing because it looked like it was written by a couple of eighth graders. One of the things, too, that uh, you have really spearheaded regarding uh, cost, just basic cost and what things cost these days, the cost of higher education, what our students are learning, what they're getting out of their education, uh, you have really spearheaded an effort to reform higher education and, and really bring a sense of not only results-oriented uh, results mission, but also trying to bring... Uh, a sense of true intellectual diversity back to campuses. Uh, Senate Bill 83, where does that stand? It passed the Senate, and now it's in the House. And what changes have been made to the bill that you want the people to know about? Well, I would go back, John, to the, uh, the last General Assembly, to Senate Bill 135, uh, which I sponsored and was passed uh, unanimously in the House, by the way, and with all but one vote in the Senate. Uh, it was a very bipartisan uh, bill that began to chip away at some of the reforms that I thought were necessary for higher education. Um, and so, but we couldn't do everything in that one bill. So Senate Bill 83, which I introduced this past March, and as you said, which passed the Senate in June, um, was designed to really start attacking probably some of the more controversial issues uh, in higher education. Higher ed in Ohio is extremely important. And let it be clear, I am a huge supporter of, uh, of higher education. We need higher education if Ohio's economy is going to remain vibrant and if we're going to attract companies to come here or attract companies who are already here to expand here in the state of Ohio. We have to provide the right workers in the, in the proper, uh, properly educated students that graduate and can go work in these facilities. Um, but there's a lot that is broken in higher education in Ohio. And I'm referring to the 14 state-supported universities. We have probably 56, I believe, uh, private colleges and universities. We don't really exercise purview over them. Uh, but I think many of them are experiencing the same problems, but we just don't have the, uh, the ability to solve them uh, as we do with the 14. So we have a lot uh, to focus on. And Senate Bill 83 is really to... Uh, attack some of the, uh, the bigger issues that I think is holding us back from being a really top-notch state for higher education. One of the things that you recently that you hosted along with Senate President Matt Huffman was the Higher Education Public University Trustee Symposium. And it was held in the atrium of the State House, and trustees from all of the public universities from around the state attended. And they heard some very interesting panel discussion, including one about preserving and protecting intellectual diversity on campus. And it was some very eye-opening comments. By the way, you can see our brand new video from the symposium that really focuses on some critical comments from the panel about DEI programs. But before we talk about that, one of the key issues uh, that was brought out was what has eroded intellectual diversity on campus is faculty hiring faculty. How, how big of a problem do you think that one form of thinking has become on campuses where we are seeing other voices that take a different opinion or disagree are being censored, 
uh, or shouted down, not only in the classroom, but on campus? There is no question that that is the core problem here. And it's really been going on, I would say, reasonably for 40 or 50 years. And, and you know, we all know that higher education has typically been left of center. Uh, it's been that way for a very long time, but it's gotten to alarming levels uh, in the last- It's become a group think. It really has, and what you end up with is a monolithic thought environment on our campuses. And our campuses should not be doing that. Our campuses should be, uh, as the Chicago principals point out that many are familiar with, there should be a true diversity of thought. Students should be exposed to different views on things. And if they have their own views on things, they should be taught how to defend those views, how to persuade others who might think differently. Uh, that's the educational process. That's teaching students how to think, not what to think. And what we've had for 40 or 50 years now is faculty who have been very, very engaged in, in hiring other faculty, uh, determining um, uh, department chairmanships, uh, determining who's the provost and so on. Uh, and they carry a lot of authority, which in my opinion is way too much. Uh, and what happens is that they tend to hire, not tend, they do hire people who think like they do. Screened by DEI statements. In fact, the Deputy Attorney General of Ohio talked about the pervasiveness of DEI statements. And one of the professors from the University of Chicago on the Protecting an Intellectual Diversity panel said that these DEI statements actually turn out to be a discriminatory mechanism that if you don't say the right things on the statement applying for a faculty job, you're immediately dismissed. Right. The, the inclusivity part of this just seems to go away because by, by, doing, by following the tenets, the basic tenets of DEI principles, you are by definition excluding lots of people. It's being discriminatory. It's yes. supposed to be diversity, right. equity, and inclusion, but it turns out to be d discriminatory. Exactly, and, and there are some new studies that, are, that have come out recently uh, that, that are, are demonstrating that DEI as it has been uh, practiced at our universities uh, is actually hurting race relations. It's not bringing people together, it's not peaceful. It is, it, it is basically sowing the seeds of victimhood. You're either the perpetrator of bad things uh, colonialism, discrimination, racism, whatever, or you're the victim of those things. And I think what we're seeing now, John, on the campuses, maybe not so much in Ohio at the moment, but in other campuses uh, in, uh, around the country, is that this victimhood business, uh, it, which has been inculcated in students for a long time now, uh, is taking hold in the anti-Semitism uh, After the Hamas uh, attack on Israel. Right, because people, a lot of the students and a lot of the faculty believe that Israel has been the colonialist in, in this There scenario. was recently, in fact, there was recently a letter um, that was posted to the Medium account of a faculty account of Ohio State University professors not representing the university, but representing more than three dozen faculty members, and then there was an additional 2,000-ish signatures. I think it was 2,013 signatures from uh, former gr from graduates and other people that uh, at, were part of university programs uh, in support of uh, Palestine. And and it's you. You're free to have an opinion. You're free to protest on campus. Uh, but also people are free to disagree uh, that an attack of a terror group on the Israeli people is uh, a terrible, terrible thing, and that Israel is well within its own rights to respond to that attack. And, and, and so people are free to have a diverse uh, set of thoughts and opinions, but those who disagree with that should not be shouted down on campus or alienated on campus. And what I think some parents are starting to figure out is those are the people that are teaching your students. Correct. That and, are teaching and, your children. And while certainly in, you know, my opinion and certainly everything in Senate Bill 83 is to encourage more speech, not to restrict speech, there's a difference and people are entitled to their own opinions and to speak what they wish uh, and what they think but they're not entitled to their own facts, okay? And, and that's, where, that's where a lot are going wrong here because if you look at the situation in Israel right now, um, the Palestinians don't like Hamas. Hamas has used the Palestinians 
and uh, for the last 16 years that they have had control of Gaza, and Hamas has been the elected uh, government. Government, government there. Uh, I'm sure people did not have the freedom to vote against sure. them. Sure. Uh, so, they, so they were duly elected. And what have they used the last 16 years to do? To, to create a peaceful, progressive environment for the Palestinians to live in peace and prosperity? No, they've been spending all that time uh, digging tunnels, uh, storing armaments, and strategizing on how to use the Palestinian people as pawns in this drive to eliminate Israel from the face of the earth. So when students on campuses are saying that they are pro-Palestinian, they don't even understand the situation. They are ignorant because, again, I'll go back to this, they have not been taught how to think or how to look at facts and arrive at their own conclusions. They're being told what to think by these wacko professors. Well, during, during the panel, uh, one of the professors talked about how faculty will tell the trustees that you don't know what you're talking about. You need to allow us to make these decisions about hiring. And what was very telling was the professor said that faculty, of course not all, but the majority of faculty believe that the university is there for them and not for the people of Ohio. Right. That was, a, I think, a real strong message to the trustees that you're in charge and you're not just a, an immediate stamp of approval to whatever the president wants or to whatever the faculty wants. The trustees are in charge of making critical decisions for the university, public universities around the state of Ohio. One of the reasons we decided to host this symposium, which is the first time it's ever been done, uh, is because we have a, a multi-pronged approach to improving higher education. You know, we're, Senate Bill 83 is the legislative approach and there will be more things after that. Uh, we are trying to work with the IUC presidents, the, uh, uh, the 14 college presidents, to try to influence their policies and, and their behaviors. But it was, clear to, it was clear to me, certainly, that the trustees, which are the governing bodies of our universities, they hire the presidents, they make policy, uh, and they decide how money gets spent, um, that, that we, were, we have not had contact with them except that we have this this approval in the Senate for advising consent on the governor's appointees, which in the past has been very perfunctory. We're now taking that seriously. And we brought the trustees together so that we could begin the educational process, develop contacts between the legislature and the trustees. And discuss what they need Correct. to make critical decisions. Correct. Because uh, President Huffman, during some of his remarks, talked about how a trustee said he was brought, all the trustees, were presented with an 1,100-page document and asked to approve it without the ability to review it. They don't have staff. They don't have the resources needed. And uh, Professor Vetter from Ohio University during his remarks, which you can also see uh, on our YouTube page right here on the record as well, you can see the four videos. He had some very interesting comments about he thinks that trustees should have somebody that truly works for them, not the president necessarily, but an independent uh, professional who, can, who works outside of the president's office and can give them information, documentation, and independent vetted facts that they need to make these critical decisions instead of relying on the word of the president. Well, that's exactly right. And so, and, and, you know, I respect uh, the, the, the trustees. I mean, they, they, these are volunteer jobs. They put a lot of time into it. I've been a public and a private uh, college trustee. So I know that if you take it seriously, you're putting a lot of time in it. And sometimes it's-, it's Uncompensated, uh, it's by the un way. Totally uncompensated. But what we're trying to do is reawaken the view that, that there is more, more responsibility than perhaps you might have thought when you became a trustee. Some good people, these are generally people who are very successful in their own rights. A lot of business people, people from the, uh, the, uh, uh, the nonprofit sector as well from the communities. Uh, these are good people, but they, they need to understand what their role is uh, in that, that the president works for them and the faculty works for them and that their customer, if you will, is the student. Uh, that's, that's who they're ultimately responsible for. And Senate Bill 83 is all about the students. Uh, in, in making the environment better for the students, in delivering to them the educational 
uh, process that they deserve to get and that they're going into debt in order to get. Right. They, they should be, they should first and foremost have a strong foundation in the field that they're going into, but also have a solid foundation of critical thinking skills where they are able to question what they are being told and, and be real, truly problem solvers and be able to face um, adversity. And there are two sides to that because they yeah. need to know uh, how to question things and how to frame questions that you know, that uh, enables them to get more information. But more importantly, I think they have, there has to be a, an environment where they feel encouraged and comfortable in challenging a, what a professor might say or what another student might say. And th we don't have that. The, the amount of um, studies that have indicated in Ohio uh, that students are uh, conservative students who identify as conservatives that the amount of uh, time that they, they believe that they self-censor is like 75%. Uh, and so it, it's very big. It, it's undeniable that our, our campuses and our faculty are left of, way left of center. Uh, and you know we established in the budget that we passed in July uh, these five institutes, civics institutes, at five of our universities. And we're moving along nicely with all of them. And one of the things that the faculties did not like on this campus was that we wrote in the legislation, and it is now law, that the faculties get no consultation on, on who gets hired to teach in these institutes. They can offer an opinion if they like, but whether it's solicited or unsolicited, they can offer an opinion, but they have no say so and they don't like that. But if we, if we didn't put that restriction on these civics institutes, we would have more of what we've been getting for the last 50 years. That's right. And I wanted to get back briefly to the uh, DEI concept. The, the DEI has been amended, uh, has been changed from its original version within the within. Civil Actually, no, we, we, we kept oh, no, the DEI it, it, piece. It's voluntary. It's voluntary. That's what uh, I was a lot of at. a lot of yeah. my colleagues on both sides in both chambers voluntary. wanted us to get rid of it altogether. Mm -hmm. Uh, I felt that um, that we I would take a more moderate approach and mm -hmm. make it you know make it optional. What we did uh, leave in it as well is the litmus testing. So DEI writing DEI statements, answering DEI related questions in an interview, cannot be used as a litmus test for hiring or promoting or granting tenure. What we did change in the bill uh, in the dash 11 version which tells you that I've been very open to changes, some of them very minor. Hours and hours of committee hearings. Oh my gosh, I, and I, I probably had 150 meetings uh, separate from the regular hearings that we've had in my committee. Um, and and we, we've listened to people, we've not taken everybody's ideas, but we've made some changes to accommodate uh, some of the issues. Some of them were mistakes that they pointed out that we made, and that's fine, that's the way bills get put together. But uh, we, uh, I took out, in the interest of getting this bill advanced, I took out the no strike provision for the faculty. Uh, I didn't like doing that. I think that's important that students never have their instruction interrupted. They shouldn't be held hostage. They're, 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 they they're pay for their, for they pay up front for their tuition, and it shouldn't get interrupted because a bunch of faculty members want a better dental plan or uh, more days off and more paid holidays, okay? Uh, go ahead and negotiate those things in your normal course of business, but don't use the students as pawns. Now, that I had to take that out in order to uh, garner more support in the House. That's, as you know, how legislation gets sure. done. Uh, but um, the, the core principles of the bill from a purely educational policy standpoint remain intact in this. What do you think that the General Assembly can do to try to empower the trustees to have the utensils, utilities, and basically the background they need to make those critical decisions in an independent form of thinking? Well, we, we had some great dialogue, and it, this was the first time we got together, so we could only accomplish so much in, in four hours or so. Um, but, and by the way, we are going to have one next year, next October. Uh, we asked. Uh, uh, the trustees if they wanted to do this again and they were overwhelmingly in favor of doing it again. So we're about to lock in a date for next October. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that we asked them about was, um, you know, what kind of support would you like to have that you're not getting? Some of the universities are providing some level of support. Is it purely independent from the president's office? Probably not. Uh, there needs to be a certain level of independence. Like, like boards have in the private sector, in, in, in the corporate world, 
okay? They have people that, that will get information for them that are not working for the CEOs of the companies. So I think we need to get to that point. I actually had uh, a couple of uh, trustees come to me and say, we don't have badges to be able to go anywhere in the university that we would like. And they're in charge. And I was, I was just shocked by that statement. Uh, and I, I asked, uh, when I got to the podium and asked the whole group, uh, how many of you have badges? Very, I mean, I, I think a handful said they did. And uh, they should not be restricted from going anywhere on campus. They are the governing board mm -hmm. of that campus. And if something bad happens, as Professor Better was saying, the trustees are on the hook. Oh, they for are. For the decision that was made. They are. In and fact, so if they haven't reviewed it and they just rubber stamped it, then they're still on the hook, though. Yeah. So Again, they need the information. We're taking these good people who are volunteering their time with no compensation. We want them to be better. We want them to make, really make sure that they understand what their role is as, as the governing body of the university. Um, and, and so I think, I think we made a lot of progress with that. The, the, the one moment which um, I, I think the place got very, very quiet when the, uh, uh, the Deputy Attorney General was talking about the personal liability related to uh, certain university policies. It, because I became aware recently of some of the activities going on with our universities in Ohio, trying to figure out ways to get around the Supreme Court decision on admissions and discrimination. There was a hush that came over the symposium. There was. When, when, and these are, the room was, I'd say most of the trustees are business people or, and or lawyers. They get it. Okay. Yeah. And when, they, when the Deputy Attorney General told them that they do not have qualified immunity if their universities adopt a policy that is contrary and discriminatory to the Supreme Court's decision, it got very, very quiet. And several of them talked with me afterwards. And they're very concerned about that. I wanted to bring that up because I knew the answer to the question that you can't do that. Uh, and that, uh, I, but I also knew that there were some surreptitious things going on and being discussed at our universities. I wanted the trustees to be aware that they are personally on the hook if their universities adopt policies or practices that fall uh, uh, on the wrong side of federal law. And, and Senate Bill 83, it, it uh, has broad support, uh, I think, throughout the legislature. Have you had a chance to talk to the governor's office regarding uh, the effort to reform and advance how we are running higher education in Ohio. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we had very close dialogue with the chancellor, uh, both the, uh, the, the current chancellor and the soon-to-be new chancellor as well. Uh, we actually took some suggestions from the chancellor's office, as we did it, at, with SB 135 in the last GA. Um, and, and I've also had a number of conversations with the governor and lieutenant governor. The Senate president and I met with both of them early on to let them know where, what the direction was. Uh, in fact, the, uh, one of the things we changed was the term, uh, uh, the term of office for trustees. As you, as, as you know, they're appointed by the governor with our advice and consent. Um, and the current terms are nine years for the universities. And the governor said to me, he said, you know, it's really hard finding, it's hard to find people willing to make a nine-year commitment. So we had originally introduced in, in my bill in March four-year terms. The governor called back after we an, announced that and said, you know, I think four is not long enough. It takes a while to get to know processes and procedures. Why don't we, why don't we make it six years uh, with no limits on how many times you can be uh, reappointed? And, you know, the Senate President and I looked at that and we thought it was reasonable, and that's what we have in the bill uh, currently. Senate Bill 83, the Higher Education Enhancement Act, make sure you watch our four videos, especially the ones on preserving and protecting intellectual diversity on campus, uh, an eye-opening panel discussion from professors who have seen exactly what goes on and can really pull the curtain back to some of the uniform thought processes and hiring practices that go on on our public universities. Senate Bill 83, it is in the House of Representatives right now, and you can follow that uh, by just uh, looking uh, on our website. We'll get you a link to it, and you can see the progress. State Senator Jerry Serino, thanks so much for your time today. My pleasure, John. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the President's Podcast right here on the record, and we'll see you next week.